Good morning. We want to welcome you to our Bible study today. Hope you had a really enjoyable Thanksgiving holiday, maybe a get-together with a few of the family and friends. And uh, today is a beautiful day. It's uh, The sun is really glaring in these southward-looking windows of my study, and I, I'm seeing a glare coming off the ceiling, but we best not complain. I think the weather man is prognosticating that we're going to get some snow uh, coming later this week. So let's enjoy the sunshine uh, while we've got it today. Someone has said jokingly, uh, growing old is not for sissies. I think Don Davis might have said that the, one of the last few times that I saw him. Uh, he's uh, sheltering at home now, so we hadn't seen him at church for a few weeks, but quite a few people say that, actually. Quite quite often this idiom, or you could call it a vernacularism, uh, references just the challenges of getting older, learning to cope with the aches and pains, the physical aches and pains, and also perhaps adjusting to the a lack of mental clarity. Uh, sometimes we just call it absent-mindedness. The, the movie, The Curious Life of Benjamin Button, uh, portrayed uh, the story of a, a man who aged backwards. In his case, longevity yielded youth instead of youth uh, yielding uh, to a, uh, being older. Uh, I don't know that there are any real, genuine, documented cases of uh, Benjamin Button kind of real-life situations. There is uh, a, a disease that is diagnosed and studied quite a bit and uh, uh, occurs every once in a while, and I'm not sure exactly. Um, it, uh, it's kind of a, a child who is uh, born with... Uh, he grows older really rapidly. And sometimes when a child bo is born, they, they actually look like they're, they've got the face and some of the other features of someone who is older. But as to uh, actually uh, aging backwards, I don't know. You can search the internet on that and you might find a few um, hints of something, but it's not it's not outright aging backwards. It's maybe just... Uh, being born uh, with progeria, and, which is uh, looking older than you really are. And, and then it's uh, sometimes uh, getting a little bit better, but not actually the growing, aging backwards. Unless you're a real-life illustration then of Benjamin Button, we all experience geriatrophy. Now, geriatrophy is a made-up word. You could look in the dictionary. I'd be delighted if you could find it, but I don't think it's there. I I uh, put the word together on my own. At least I think I did. Uh, and sometimes you read quite a bit and then you think somebody else's ideas become your own. But I don't remember ever seeing the word geriatrophy in print. But it's, it's just my idea of... Uh, it's a compound word... Uh, I submitted the word to the dictionary, or I intended to, but never got around to it. Uh, I don't know if it would have been rejected or accepted. But basically, it's a, 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 a compound word. Geriatrics is the study of aging, as most all of you know. And atrophy is a word that just describes kind of a withering down or a withering away or a wearing down. So I put the two words together. Geriatrophy is that which occurs naturally as we, we grow older. And there are some people who seem to defy the age, aging process, at least for a little while, but eventually, you know, they, they do grow old and die uh, like everybody else. As we seniors are sometimes prone to proclaim, I, I'm now on the downhill slide. I've, I commented to a couple of senior ladies the other evening, one of them being Jeannie, 
about how I couldn't believe that it has now been 15 years since my father passed away. And the three of us all thought for a little bit how time flies as we get older. You remember, if you can, when we're, we're young, it seems like it, it took Christmas forever to finally arrive. But as we get older, we find out that one Christmas runs into another. For quite a while, then, I was content to live in the Middle Ages. But the Middle Ages have, have now given way to being a senior citizen. The latter years. Now, don't, don't misunderstand. I'm still quite content. And I have so much to be thankful for, as you likely do as well. I'm in good health. I really take no medicines. My mind is still sharp, at least if you believe me and not my wife. I have a few, a few aches, a few uh, pains here and there, but nothing that I can't really deal with. And most of the time I can cope without even over-the-counter assistance, medicine-wise. And I, I have no plans to kick the bucket anytime soon. But I must admit that the last few years, maybe in particular, have presented some difficult hurdles. On some days, maybe we'll just call them my not-so-good days, I, I find myself wrestling with cynicism. From a moralistic point of view, and you've heard me ramble on about this in other sermons, I suppose. It appears to me that our nation is truly, truly in decline from a moral point of view. And I have to confess, this weighs on me greatly. Whereas the Word of God used to, to have great sway, it seems now, sadly so to me, that younger ones are predominantly animated, not so much anymore by what the Word of God says, but by their feelings. For many, the words of Jeremiah found in Jeremiah 10 and verse 23 have become a, the distant prayer of a bygone era. There, Jeremiah prayed, I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself nor is it in a man who walks to direct his own steps. And the writings of King Solomon appear to, to quite a few to be totally irrelevant. In Proverbs 3 and verse 5, we read, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. Uh, politically, with such distrust and infighting and corruption, we, one has to wonder what the future holds for our beloved nation. And thirdly, from an ecclesiastical point of view, just a fancy word there that refers to the church, I, I have found on some cynical days to be dismayed by dwelling on the absence of loyalty and tenacity on the part of some. Ones who walk away or perhaps fall away when the going gets tough or, or ones who become entranced or enamored or captivated by the myth of the greener grass. For me, this has truly been disheartening. But thankfully, my disappointments in this realm have been bolstered and buoyed by the fidelity of so many, many others who remain faithful and true. I received a card this past Wednesday on the day before Thanksgiving, and 
it came at a really good time for me because I was in kind of one of these uh, down modes or moods. And the card was a Thanksgiving card. And it said, among other things, your dedication to love, to loving, serving, and being a light in a, a needy world is an inspiration. Thank you for the all that you do, and may God richly bless you. And I called the person or persons that sent the card, and I told them how much that meant to me, uh, that it really did uh, boost my spirits a great deal. Maybe that reminds us of the need that we all have to receive words of encouragement from time to time. And maybe I could give you an assignment uh, that you don't have to go out of your home to do this, uh, I, unless I guess it's to mail something or to get some stamps. But why don't you sit down this week and write a card of encouragement to somebody else? Uh, because they might be having one of these uh, down moments. And, you know, even young people can become cynical sometimes, but especially that might be true for some of those in our church family who are older. In this marvelous season of joy, I'm working to combat my occasional cynicism by rereading Paul's epistle to the Philippians. It's a letter that invites highlighting. So get your marker out as you begin to read from it because there'll be verses that you'll want to highlight. For example, one from each chapter. There's only four chapters, but Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 2.5, have this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3 and verse 14 I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Sounds so uh, poetic as Paul writes it. And then another, Philippians 4 and verse 19, God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. This letter to the church at Philippi is also a letter that's filled with joy. I urge you to read this letter this week. As I mentioned, it has just four chapters, but they are powerful, mind-altering, and heart-shaping chapters. The Apostle Paul is one impressive man. He writes in Philippians 4 and 11, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. So as we turn this week to reading this brief missive, really it has just a total of 94 verses, uh, I think you'll be able to see that the Apostle Paul was not someone who was living out of touch with reality. Sometimes people maybe insinuate this, that, uh, that Paul wasn't being real, but he was. And he delineates in his epistle the problems that, that he uh, was confronted with. He didn't shy away from enumerating them. He himself was imprisoned, we read in chapter 1 and verse 7. In chapter 1 and verse 15 through 17, he describes some of his fellow preachers as ones driven by envy and strife and ambition. In chapter 1 and verse 28, he spoke of opposition. Chapter 2 and verse 14, he urges that we not grumble and dispute. And in chapter 2 and verse 21, he talks about some who were living for self-interest. In chapter 3, Three and verses 18 and 19, he calls out those who, and I quote, are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. 
In chapter 4 and verse 2, he addressed the problem of disharmony between two women in the church, Euodia and Syntyche. In chapter 4 and verse 15, he painfully recalled the lack of support from, a many, of the, from, from uh, many of the congregations, uh, quite a few of which that he had helped to establish himself. So let's make no mistake, uh, Paul did not dwell in some prophylactic bubble. His world was anything but sanitized. Yet he writes words that we, we want to live out so very badly ourselves. He says in chapter 4 and verse two, uh, 12, I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in poverty. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, of having abundance and suffering need. I have titled this morning's sermon, Satisfaction Amid Disconsolation. Oh, I'm not going to break out and sing a song this morning. There is a beautiful song that we used to sing called Come Ye Disconsolate that word having to do with maybe sadness or uh, discouragement. So I want to ask the question, how was Paul able to remain satisfied in the midst of so many problems? We might even say in the midst of such gloom. Again, listen to his uh, statement here. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. So I want to ask us today in just a little time, that we have remaining here. What, what was his secret? Was it simply an exercise of mind over matter? Sometimes I refer to the New English Bible. I don't know why I like to read it once in a while. It uh, gives a little bit uh, different twist occasionally on our English language. But uh, it, the New English Bible, I think, really misses this particular verse, verse 12 uh, in Philippians 4. It renders it by saying this, I have learned to find resources in myself, whatever my circumstances. Paul's key, or Paul's secret, which really was not, a secret in the sense that it was intentionally hidden from anybody else because it's proclaimed all throughout the scriptures. Paul's key or Paul's secret was not, not rooted in himself. He says in chapter 4 and verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. A few verses earlier, in chapter 4 and verse 4, Paul writes, saying, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, Rejoice. And then he reminds the brethren at Philippi, in chapter 4 and verse 5, uh, he says, The Lord is near. For Paul, this nearness of the Lord uh, is of a dual nature, I think. First of all, it's, it has an eschatological thrust. You can go online and see my notes, and I'll give you a few references there from the Philippian letter where Paul is talking about eschatology in a first, setting, first century uh, setting co uh, context. But in this case, the nearness of the Lord also seems to be uh, an existential element. What, and what I mean by that is just uh, a personal, a, a real personal uh, reality that the Lord is near. Kind of like we read in Psalm 34 and verse 18 where the psalmist said, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. As Paul grew in his discipleship, 
he learned. Now that's a word that's worth underlining. He didn't grasp all of this immediately. Even though he was a brilliant scholar, even before he became a Christian, but he learned, he says this in his own epistle here, he learned uh, to have a better vision of the things around him. And maybe we should emphasize a better vision for the things above him or the higher things. And as I alluded to earlier, some might make a silly argument that Paul was viewing everything through rose-colored glasses, but I don't think that holds water at all. But Paul did grow to come see to come see all things through the bloody and the beautiful lens of the cross of Jesus. And that explains a lot about how he's able to sustain such a, an upbeat disposition in the midst of sometimes doom and gloom. He was a partaker of God's grace, and subsequently he was a willing participator in the proclamation of the gospel of his Lord Jesus Christ. Paul grew to find great joy in even being poured out as a drink offering, poured out in the sacrifice and service of the faith. For him, that was a source of great joy. Philippians 2 and verse 17. In further clarifying the strength of Paul's ability or the source of the strength of Paul's ability to derive uh, satisfaction amid disconsolation, all we have to do is backpedal a few verses and read again from Philippians 4 and verses 6 and 7. Paul says, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, here it is, let your request be made known to God. And then he adds, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So if we're able to, like Paul, to fully acclimate and orient our minds uh, to better dwell on things that are righteous, uh, not self-righteous, but things that are righteous, uh, Paul promises, as he does in Philippians 4 and verse 8, he says, the God of peace shall be with you all. Biblically, in trying to answer the question, how, how did Paul find satisfaction amid disconsolation? The answer is really uh, drilled home in Philippians 4 and verse 19. Uh, we, we've seen it other, uh, in other places in the, this same chapter. He says uh, that he finds his strength I can do all things through him, through Christ, who strengthens me. He talks about how the Lord is near. He talks about casting our burdens. Well, that's a Peter term, but Paul says that he urges us to not be anxious, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to the Lord. And then he says there, the peace of God uh, will be with you. And then he says in 4 8, the God of peace will, shall be with you. And 4 19, he says, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now let's close uh, with one more thought before we bow for prayer. Paul's ability to be content whatever the circumstances he was experiencing was, I think, directly connected to his being in Christ Jesus. And 
maybe herein lies our problem as to why we can sometimes uh, be grumpy and complaining and uh, even uh, cynical from time to time is that maybe the problem is that we're not we're not all in <clears throat> we we've been born and raised most of us in a country where we're taught to pull ourselves up by our own boot, bootstraps and and really that's a concept that tends to dethrone god so we have to kind of relearn again contrary to our american upbringing how we we, we've got to learn to trust in God. We will never find satisfaction amid disconsolation until and unless we learn to let go and let God. Would you bow as we pray? Father, thank you so much for the Apostle Paul for the great lessons we learn from his many letters. And Father, we're praying today that you would help us, uh, many of us as we grow older, but all of us as we grow throughout life, to learn to be able to look to you as a source of our strength and, and learn as we have talked about here this morning of the need to let go, to not be anxious for anything, but to let go and to let you help us. And so, Father, we're, we're trying to learn to do that more and more, to trust you, to pray to you, to cast our burdens on you. And when we come to do that more and more, Father, bless us richly as we lean on you. Bless us as a church family. Bless our nation. At this point in our history, we need your help so much. Thank you so much for Christ our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope you have a great week.